as I was thinking through what I'd share with regards to gifts, one of the people that I thought was Chris, who's got a deep love for the word and um, has got an incredible memory. And I wish sometimes that I had some of your gifts, but God's given me what he's given me. And so that is what it is. But uh, I'm so excited that the first Sunday I get back, I get to sit under your preaching, and I know you would have spent many hours praying, asking for this beautiful community, Lord, what is the word that you are wanting to share? And so, um, Chris, I know you'll smash it, I just want to pray for you, and uh, so look forward to sitting under your ministry. And so, Lord, I thank you for Chris, a young man um, that is doing incredible work, Lord, that is walking closely with you. I thank you for his story that uh, is unfolding right before our eyes, and we want to take courage from his story and the things that you've done in actually such a short space of time. And this morning, as he opens the word and as he speaks, Lord, I pray that you would fill his mouth with your words, Lord. I pray that every word would be measured and that you would begin to minister through what he's got to say to us this morning. And so, Lord, anoint him, give him clarity of mind and thought, and help him to dispel and give the word that you have given him for us this morning. And so we as the hearers open up our hearts and our ears to receive what you're wanting to do this morning. In your wonderful name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Tools. Am I coming through? One, two, one, two. You got a preacher in you there, Tools? Hey, I can, uh, I can check you. It's, uh, it's amazing. It says when the disciples returned from mission, how they returned with such a joy. And it's just great to see your joy. Great to have you back, Tools. And um, great to see you this morning. I don't say that lightly. It really is beautiful to see each one of your faces. I was just thinking, uh, we've had the privilege as well of being away, or not away, but ministering in different churches over the last two weeks. Last week we were in Lesotho with a group of about maybe 15 or 20 people in the church. And I remember just sitting there and I thinking, Lord, the smaller group of people here, and I was like, what a privilege. 15 people. You had 12, and you, and you invested yourself into them. And the week before that, we were down on the south coast, um, just ministering at, at Harry's church, and uh, just a joy to be with the church of God across the globe, just taking teams out to both sides. Man, what a privilege. What a privilege to, to be able to serve Jesus, as Tool says, to give your gift, to offer yourself up to him. And uh, I just want to say thank you for being here this morning. Uh, I, this morning, as I was praying, and uh, just I, I really felt a sense of opposition and, and a battle that's going on for the church. And uh, sometimes it's a battle even just to get to church. It's not easy. Perhaps you're going through a week that's, that's crazy, that's wild, that things are happening, you're in the midst of a trial, it might be difficult, it might be um, that you're battling with things, it might be that you're feeling weak, it might be that you're feeling tired or weary, it might be that you're feeling like you've got nothing, nothing to give, it might be that you, you and your wife are not seeing eye to eye, it might be that your pipe burst at home before you arrived here, like me, this morning, I'm like, come on, Lord, really today? But, uh, but uh, there's an opposition that's real. You know, he's real. We, we have Satan who's actively working against our faith to try and destroy who we are in Jesus and stop us from gathering together. And, and, and I just felt, I felt to say well done for being here this morning. Actually, it takes faith to be here. The church, the gathered ones, the, the, the gathered ones who are called out for God's special purpose. And, uh, and well done for being here. Opposition is real. Satan is real. I was thinking, you know, we live in this, this world where everybody offers their weak opinions, but, but it fails to offer truth. You know, Satan is real. Hell is real. Opposition is real. Jesus is real. Heaven is real. Righteousness is real. Freedom is real. Truth is available. Peace is available. Like declarations of God's word. You know, we, we actually we need to hear truth every day in our lives to bring us out of this, this battle that we constantly find ourselves in. It's good that you're here. Praise God that you're here. We're busy going through a, a series in the book of Mark, and uh, we find ourselves now in Mark chapter 8. And, uh, and again, Jesus often finds himself in opposition. And uh, I just want to encourage you, if you're finding yourself in opposition, you're in good company. Jesus did that. The church does that. We, we, we find ourselves in opposition. And, and if it's not self-inflicted, I'd say you're probably doing something right. Because, because to have opposition means you're pushing forward. It's amazing. Whenever you try and see the kingdom of God advance, there's, there's resistance. And, and don't be surprised by that as we walk out our journey of faith with Jesus. And uh, Jesus finds that too. Even in Mark chapter 8, we're building through. And throughout the book of Mark, we find him having opposition from, from Pharisees, from, from different people, from different sects, from different groups, as he, as he seeks to push forward the kingdom of God. But at the same time, there's these moments and these glimpses of glory 
that happen. As he's busy ministering, we see him busy um, um, raising up the dead and healing and, and just these glimpses, a taste of, of the true kingdom that's coming. It's an exquisite gospel that we get to walk through, and I'm, I'm so glad because it brings us front and center with Jesus, the person of Jesus. And even today, as we build towards the, the central parts of the book of Mark, we, we confront it with Jesus and, uh, and, and who he is and what he's doing and what he's calling us to and how we're involved in this beautiful story that he's, that he's rolling out. So where to begin? I've got a long passage. Should we dive in? Mark chapter 8, verse 1. So Jesus has been doing many things and... Uh, and right now we find ourselves at a, at a second miracle, which is quite similar to the, the first miracle. So I'm not going to spend a, a heck of a lot of time here because we've, we've gone through it in a sense in a bit. So Jesus, Mark chapter 8, verse 1, during those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him, which usually means something great is going to happen. To him and said, I have compassion. Beautiful. I have compassion. A willingness to suffer with. A willingness to give myself to. I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way. And because some of them have come a long, uh, because some of them have come a long distance. So, what's my aim for this morning? I, I think my aim, my heart. There were some words that came through. Um, Lorraine had a word about us worshiping behind bars. And I, and I felt that this morning, actually, in a sense, we, 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 we feel like we're, we're stuck behind something. And, and my desire for this morning is that we would see Jesus more clearly. That's my heart, that we would see him for who he is, that he would reveal himself to us afresh. For those who've been walking a long time, that you would see him again clearly. For those who are perhaps investigating and, and find themselves just here, that you would see him perhaps for the first time, the wonder of who, of who he is. My prayer is that he would reveal himself to us yet again. Is that good? You with me? Okay, so what have you been seeing through the book of Mark? So we've seen Jesus revealing himself. Throughout the book of Mark, we see him doing different things. We see him speaking. We see him um, speaking truth, teaching, raising up, doing miracles. We see a whole lot of things. We see God proclaiming him as his son, Mark chapter 1. We see Jesus healing a, a paralytic man. Do you remember when Nick spoke about him coming down through the roof? And, and Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. We see Jesus being able to forgive us of our sin. Beautiful. I mean, freedom from our sin. You know, you can spend a whole preach there again. Just actually, can we live free as a people? But not only does he say, son, your sins are forgiven. Get up your mat. Uh, get up, take up your mat, and walk. There's a healing that happens. We see Jesus being able to, to heal people. We see Jesus speaking about binding the strong man. Actually defeating Satan by, 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 by tying his hands to himself side to make him powerless through his work in advancing the kingdom. We see that in Mark chapter, um, chapter 2, verse 5. Oh, sorry, chapter 3, verse 23. We see Jesus calming the storm. He says, quiet, be still. Three words, and the storm is quiet. Lord over creation. I wonder, COVID, what a storm it's creating across the globe, isn't it? Quiet. Be still. Just a word from Jesus can, can set us at peace. And what do the disciples say? Who is this? Who is this? Again, Jesus busy making known to, to the people that he's teaching who he is. And those who are interested are finding out and, and his, their eyes are being opened. Who is this man that can speak to creation and it obeys him? Lord over creation. We see Jesus being Lord over demons. The, the man who was tied up bound by chains, a thousand demons, or maybe more, 6,000, some say, a legion of demons, completely controlled by outward forces, breaking chains. Jesus comes up to him and sets him free in a moment. Isn't that incredible? Where do you find yourself this morning? What do you feel like's holding you back? In a moment, Jesus can set you free. You see him lord over death. Wow. Lord over death. He lost a loved one. You understand how powerful this is. And you've lost someone you love and that you care for. And, and Jesus walks past and raises them from the dead. That is incredible. And, and some of us have had to walk through that death. But, but Jesus is actually saying, yeah, there's something future that's coming. There's a, there's a glimpse of the, of the resurrection that's coming. And one day, those who are in me will be raised to life again. Jesus, power over life and over death. We see Jesus, Lord over diseases. Wow, a woman who's been 
um, bleeding for 12 years, spent everything she had to try and be set free. She's, we see her pressing through the crowd to try and take hold of Jesus' garment just to be able to set free. And in a sheer act of desperation and faith, she reaches out and touches him. And she's healed. Beautiful, beautiful picture of her pressing into the center of the crowd to take a hold of Jesus and Jesus healing her. See Jesus going out to the outskirts of the crowd where his blood is poured out so that this lady can find herself healed. Beautiful pictures. Lord over disease. One day where we will be set free completely from every disease that we now experience. We see Jesus truly coming to set people free from religious works, from unbelief. The process of revelation. Jesus opening up our eyes that we may see him. Opening up our ears that we may hear him. Opening up our mouths that we may speak about him. The wonder of the gospel, the wonder of the kingdom advancing. And here again we see another miracle happening. Again trying to show us something of who he is. And this, this miracle, there's two accounts. The one is where he feeds 5,000 men. This one is 4,000 people. So a slightly smaller crowd happens in a different place. Um, there's debate over whether it's the same thing, but I, I don't think it is. Um, and, and we see Jesus here in a, in, a, in a moment. And there's just three things that I'd like to pick out from this. One, Jesus is abundantly able to provide for your every need. Abundantly able to provide for your every need. I think that's so important with this economic whatever downgrade or, or whatever next year is going to be, we need to know that our God can provide for our every need. In the midst of a, of a desert, in the midst of the wilderness, it speaks about how, how he's in the wilderness and there Jesus is able to make bread come from just small pieces of bread. It's almost like a picture of, of even in the Israelites where, where they're in the desert and, and, and the bread just fell from heaven and now Jesus is making bread appear from just a couple of loaves and, and himself being the true bread. There's this beautiful picture that's busy happening in a single moment where I can provide for your every need. Both, both physical, both material, both spiritual. Your every need you will find in Christ, in Christ alone. Your every bit of provision that you, that you could possibly need, He has covered for you to do what He's called you to do. I think that's the one truth that we can learn from it. In the first miracle, there's 12 baskets left over. And the second miracle, there's seven baskets left over. There's an abundance of left over. There's an abundance for the people of God that he's able to provide. My second point is, is that, um, and I'm not a big numbers guy, but I do think there is some significance in, in the numbers that God provides you. So the first one is 12, often a picture of, of the entirety of the people of God. So we have the 12 tribes of Israel. Every tribe comes from them. We have the 12 apostles. We have a, a number of 144,000 in Revelation, 12 times 12. It's the, the picture of the fullness of the people of God. God is able to abundantly supply for the full measure of his people, for the fullness of, of every person that finds himself in the people of God. Isn't that beautiful? Second number seven is a, is a picture of completeness. God creates in seven days, fullness, done, completely satisfied in seven days. So what is that saying? God can abundantly supply all of his needs for all of his people. That's, I think, in some ways what God's saying. And then you've got the, the other picture of the Jewish people. The first miracle happened, in, in a sense, in the Jewish nation or a Jewish place. Second miracle happening in a relatively Gentile place. What is that saying? Both for Jews and Gentiles. Christ is able to sufficiently supply every need. Take courage from that. Sometimes I think we can doubt. He's able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. That's why I say it's good that you're here. Even if you feel like you have so little to offer, bring your little to Jesus and watch what he can do. He can do abundantly. You can give your little morsel of bread and he can feed 4,000 people with that. Incredible God that we serve. Again, Jesus trying to open up our eyes because often circumstances dictate what we do and how we do it. But Jesus is saying, open your eyes and see me for who I am. Then the, the story goes on. And Jesus, the Pharisees come to Jesus again, opposition again. And what do they say? The Pharisees came and begin to question Jesus, to test him. They ask for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Sorry, this is verse 11. Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them. He got back into his boat 
and crossed to the other side. And then Jesus says, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread. Oh, I love these guys. Except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. A, a clear warning from Jesus for the disciples. We see the disciples, I mean the Pharisees coming to test Jesus. This is a word for trying to take control of, trying to take uh, to, to get the upper hand again, so they're trying to, to test him, to lower his position, so that they can again have their powerful position, which they are so used to. And Jesus says, actually, I'm not going to give you a sign. I'm not going to give you a sign, because even if I did give you a sign, you would be following me, not out of love, but out of obligation, because I'm, and he's like, actually, I'm not going to waste my time with you, because you're proud, you're stubborn, you're self-righteous, and yet, in a sense, he actually pulls himself away from them. And this is the last time that Jesus has a discussion with the Pharisees in the book of Mark. Serious warning. You know, you can continually oppose Jesus. You can continually oppose him and want the upper hand and be proud and self righteous and, and arrogant in a sense. And it gets to the point where Jesus says, Actually, I'm getting in the boat and I'm leaving you to suffer in your own self righteousness, is essentially what he's doing here. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed over to the other side. And it's the last time that Jesus actually interacts with the, the Pharisees. It's a clear warning. And then Jesus warns his disciples even, and he says, be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And the poor disciples, oh, how doff we are at times. Jesus is trying to tell them something, and, and, and they're thinking about something else. You know, they, 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 they're seeing the circumstance rather than hearing Jesus. You know, they, they're worried, oh, oh, we didn't bring bread. I mean, honestly, he's just fed 5,000 and 4,000. You know, you'd think something would click, you know, like one loaf. At least a thousand people are covered, you know, like simple math, you know. But what is he teaching? Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. And uh, this is in, in different books. So in the book of Matthew, the yeast of the Pharisees is spoken about as the teaching of the Pharisee. So, so those that, the things that they teach, you know, they're, they're, like Phil spoke about so well yesterday, you know, you need to tithe even your herbs. I mean, not yesterday, sorry, last week. Even your herbs you need to tithe. The, the, this law upon law upon law of, of trying to appease God. Be careful of the teaching of the Pharisee. Even in ourselves, we, we're naturally religious. There's a Pharisee in you and there's a Pharisee in me. I'm naturally religious. I mean, from the smallest kid, you can see it. You know, when a kid does something wrong, what's the first thing that they try and do? One, hide. Second thing, do everything right. <laughs> I've washed the dishes, I've cleaned my room. Then you know, you're like, oh, this kid's done something wrong, you know, because actually we, we're naturally religious. We naturally try to fix ourselves. And, and that's the, the essence of, of a works-based righteousness, a works-based um, religion, is, is we try and fix ourselves. And Jesus is saying, be careful of the teaching of the Pharisee. In Luke, it says, be careful of hypocrisy. Be careful of saying one thing and living another way. Be careful of that, the hypocrisy. And in some ways, we are all slightly hypocrites, but in other ways, you can outwardly live one way and be speaking another way, and that is not good. Jesus is saying, be careful of them. But here in the book of Mark, I think, and, and as I've read a vast number of commentators, they're speaking about unbelief. Unbelief. And, and you might think, well, I, I believe. I believe in Jesus. And then why would Jesus be warning his disciples? You know, I've, I've thought about that. Like, like why would he be warning the, his disciples if it's, if it's possible for them to unbelieve in a sense? And, uh, and I think for a, a number of reasons. And, um, and you see in chapter Hebrews, sorry, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18. And, uh, and it speaks about how the people of God, even while they were in the, the wilderness, they continued to, un, to, to not believe God. They continued to, to take their own stance rather than, than hearing God and obeying Him. So it says, and, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter their rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that those that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Unbelief is essentially saying, God, I know more than you. I'm not going to do what you say. Even in my fear, I'm going to do what I think is better even in my fear. And it says, because of their unbelief, they were disobedient to the commands of God. And Jesus is saying, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. Be careful that you're not found unbelieving. Be careful that you're not found placing yourself above that of Jesus and knowing more than him. And, and in a sense, it's pride. Unbelief is saying, actually, I'm, I'm, 
I'm not going to believe you because I think I know better. Even in the, in the, in the weak sense of unbelief. Does that make sense? We've got to be so careful when, when, when we feel our, find ourselves being in a place of unbelief. I kept thinking about Abraham, the father of faith, who did not waver through unbelief, but rather he considered God. Even though he saw his circumstances, he considered God faithful to fulfill his promise and able to fulfill his promise. Unbelief, I mean, belief is actually it's a place of humility. It's like saying, I, I, I don't know, but I'm trusting you. And Jesus is saying, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. God opposes the proud. He opposes them, but he shows favor to the humble. Faith comes when one steps into the boat with Jesus and does not prefer to remain in the safety on the shore. I thought that was a good quote. Because the, the, the Pharisees, they decide to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remain where I am comfortable in my own space rather than stepping into the boat with Jesus and following him into everything that he has. And the precious disciples, they discussed with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? <laughs> How often we do that? You know, God busy speaking to us about something and calling us into something. And our eyes are so fixed on the circumstance around us. So often that happens to us. Jesus is trying to tell us something. It's, he's, he's, he's trying to warn us about something. But, but we find ourselves, our eyes, so fixed on the circumstance. All they can see at the moment is, the, is their physical needs, in a sense. What a warning, you know? It's amazing how often that we, as disciples, I think allow circumstance to dictate the direction that we take rather than the voice of God. I'll say that again. I think as disciples, so often we allow the circumstance that we find ourselves in to dictate the direction that we take rather than following the voice of God. So it's, a, it's a warning for us. It's a warning. We can be so fixed on our circumstance that we can miss what God is speaking to us about, what he is calling us into. And I was thinking about next year. I mean, how many of you have heard about the trips that are happening next year? And the first thing that you think is, I can't afford it. And your circumstance dictates the, 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 the decision that you make before you've heard the voice of God and whether he's calling you there. A warning for us. Don't look at the circumstance, but hear the voice of Jesus. What is he calling you into? God, I would say 100% of the time, calls you into something far bigger than you can do. Throughout Scripture, if God's calling you to something, you can't do it. <laughs> like I'll tell you that at the, at the start, you can't. Every person that God calls, he calls into a faith venture because the just shall live by faith. Which means that we should constantly be, be in, a, in a story that's bigger than our own. Even as Tula said, actually we should be involved in the global story because when we get stuck here, actually our circumstance dictates the actions that we, that we, that we take. Warning again. And Jesus says, aware of their discussion. Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? I wonder what conversations we get involved in, you know, that actually we shouldn't be involved in. Do you not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? <laughs> I'm so glad. This is encouraging for me because I find myself here often. <laughs> I don't know about you. Is it just me? But like Jesus is saying something and I'm, I'm seeing something else, you know? But, but here's Jesus busy, busy explaining, actually, you've got eyes, but you can't see. You've got ears, but you can't hear. Do you still not understand? Which means that Jesus expects us to understand. I find that quite daunting. Jesus expects us to understand what he's talking about, which means that we need to apply ourselves to everything that he says. I don't think there's any excuse for laziness in the kingdom of God. Not one excuse for laziness in the kingdom of God. I think sometimes we, 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 we can live in this funny Christian world where you think things are going to happen to you just by osmosis. I don't think that's the case. God calls you to understand what his will is. Ephesians 5, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. There's a responsibility on us to search out the deep truths of God. 
He puts that on us and he expects that from us. He expects us to understand what he's talking about when he speaks. It's quite daunting, isn't it? Which means that we need to open up the scriptures. We need to look deeply into the, what the word is saying. We need to look deeply into Jesus and who he is. Yeah. The disciples are anxious about lack of bread. Jesus is anxious about their lack of faith. There's a responsibility, an expectation that we know what God's will is. Being with Jesus, I think for those who have walked along, ah, for me, for me, you can get familiar with Jesus and fail to see him for who he is. It's, it's, it's a danger. He speaks about it even a little bit earlier. A prophet is without honor except in his own time. There's a, there's a town. There's a familiarity. Uh, that. You can be familiar with him and fail to see him for who he is. He expects us to understand the, the wonder of who he is. The proximity to Jesus must grow into understanding and understanding into faith. Or else, like Judas, it will in the end inoculate them to the meaning of his person and work. What does that mean? When we're with him, we've got to grow in understanding of who he is. Otherwise, he just becomes a means to an end, like it happened with Judas. Jesus became a means to an end. His goal was money, actually. He discarded Jesus to get what he really wanted. A fair warning for us. God wants us. Can you, can you still not understand? Which is why he's warning us about the yeast of the Pharisees. A lack of understanding is not pleasing to Jesus. It leads to the hardness of heart. They were completely amazed speaking about the first miracle with feeding of, of, of the 5,000. For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. It's like you have eyes, but you can't see. I feel like that. I feel like that. I must be honest. But God calls us to cry out for understanding. Proverbs 1 verse 1. Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction and for understanding words of insight. Proverbs 2. My son, if you accept my words and store my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as for silver, and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Ask, and it will be given to you. All of these scriptures are our part. You will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. All of your heart. It's amazing. You'd think the Pharisees would have got it, eh? I mean, they knew the scriptures. They sought them out. You know, they, they applied themselves to the Scriptures. And you think, well, geez, how does this work then? You know, do I read every day and understand all knowledge and all wisdom? Will I then gain understanding? I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. John 5, 44, you study the Scriptures, speaking to the Pharisees, diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These very Scriptures testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. I think Jesus is saying something far deeper than just understanding the scriptures. He says, do you understand me? Do you know me? Do you see me for who I am? What a deep word. Do we know Jesus? Do we see him for who he is? And do we live in a way that shows that? I think that's what Jesus is getting to. And the scripture moves on after the warning to the disciples. And, and Jesus can be strong with us at times. And that's okay. God disciplines those he loves. I'm okay to sit under the discipline of God because, because I'm not leaving him. Like the disciples got on the boat. No matter what he does, no matter what he says, I'm not leaving him. You are the, 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 the hope of life. You know, the, the Pharisees think, okay, fine, you, you're being hard. I'm leaving you. But the disciples are like, I need you. I can't go anywhere else. I'm desperate. Then Jesus heals a man at Bethsaida. And sometimes I thought this passage is a little bit out of place. You know, he's, there's this warning, there's the feeding of the 5,000. Then he goes on to healing this man, and then he asks him a question. And I don't think it's, it's random. I think Jesus is, is busy teaching the disciples a physical represent, representation of what they currently are finding themselves or where they're finding themselves spiritually. This is the only miracle where Jesus has to do it twice, so to speak. And many people have thought, well, that means I, I can do a half miracle. <laughs> it's fine, as long as you just get half a miracle. I don't think that's what Jesus is teaching here. 
He's not giving room for half miracles. But, uh, but he's showing them something. It's almost like a two-step approach to, to making this man see. And, uh, and let's pick it up in chapter 20, uh, sorry, verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside of the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on them, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands, touched, touched him, put his hands on the man's eyes. And then his eyes were open and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into every village. This wasn't Jesus having a bad day, his lack of power. He's, he's trying to teach his disciples something. He's trying to say, as much as understanding is a, is a work on your part, it's also a supernatural work on my part. And only my touch can allow you to see clearly as you should. And sometimes this happens as a process of revelation throughout your life. And, and, and in this case, it's two parts. And I, and I think it's actually sandwiched between two processes of revelation because Jesus then asked him, who do you say that I am? And, and, Jesus, and, and the disciples say, you're the Messiah. And even their understanding of the Messiah is only in part. And Jesus again has to open up their eyes to teach them what it means for there to be a Messiah or who the Messiah is. So Jesus is showing them something here. He's showing them that, that you do need to apply yourself. You do need to, to offer yourself up and seek God with all of your heart. But ultimately, it's only through my touch. I love that he touches him. It's intimacy. It's not far off. It's not just a voice, but it's a touch. It's a touch. It's a laying on of hands. It's a, it's a me transferring myself to you so that you can see clearly as you should. There's a supernatural way that God reveals himself to us that we need to know and and that's outside of ourselves that's given to us as a gift and that's something of what Jesus is teaching I'm not going to go into the the full detail of of the spit and all of that but actually we need a touch of Jesus we need our eyes to be open so that we can see clearly what he's doing and what he's saying the world is is so strong in its opinion of everything Actually, we, we need Jesus to again touch our eyes. I, my prayer last night as I was, as I was finishing up prep, would you, would you touch my eyes again, Jesus, so I can, I can see you for the wonder of who you are? Would you open up my eyes so that I can see? Because if I'm finding you boring or dull or, or there's no new revelation, then I'm in a dangerous place. I'm in a dangerous place because I'm satisfied with, with what I know about you. All of eternity is going to be the eternity of, of God revealing himself to us and us worshiping in awe and wonder as he shows us the wonder of who he is and what he's been doing through eternity past and into eternity future. This process of revelation, of seeing God for who he is. And that starts here and now. I don't think we should, we should stop crying out, God, would you, would you touch my eyes so that I may see you for who you are. Otherwise, I'm going to look at circumstance and allow that to dictate to me who you are, or even my own mind. The danger with us is that, is that we, we can invent our own God. You know, we can invent our own Jesus. And, and, and actually, unless Jesus touches our eyes, all we will see is a, is a form of Jesus rather than the truth of who he is, the fullness of who he is. Does that make sense? And then Jesus expects a response from his disciples. Chapter two, uh, sorry, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Excuse me. But what about you? This is the moment, or in some ways, the climax, the central piece of the, of the gospel of Mark. What about you? Sitting in your chair today, what about you? What about me? Who do you say that I am? The most important question that we'll ever answer. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned him not to tell anyone about, tell anyone about it. The most important question that we will ever answer is who do you say that I am. After all that you've seen, after all that you've heard over these last couple of weeks, after all that you've heard over your lifetime about Jesus, who do you say that he is? 
And that question, the way that you answer it, will determine the rest of your life. It will determine the course of your life, the direction of your life, and who you give yourself to. And it's amazing. And how you answer that question will determine how much of Jesus reveals himself to you. It's powerful. Because you can, like the, like the Pharisees, you can say you're just a teacher, you're just a person, you're just, in a sense, somebody else. And Jesus, in a sense, closes himself off to any more revelation to them. But to the, to the disciples, he say, you are the Messiah. Even in their slightly blurred view of what that means, you are the Messiah. You are from God. You are the Son of God. You are the King. You are the anointed one of David that all the scriptures speak about. You are him, and you are here. That will determine how much Jesus opens up to his disciples for the rest of the book of Mark. And we see that. We see Jesus zoning in now with his, with his disciples throughout the, best, the rest of the book of Mark. And he opens their eyes to such wonderful things. Francois is going to be speaking next week about the transfiguration, about uh, the wonder of who God is and the glory that he is. But in this moment, how you answer that question determines how much of that you see. And it's so important how you answer that question. Does that make sense? You know, Peter answered the question correctly, and I would encourage you, you may not know the fullness of who Jesus is today. Sometimes we don't. Even Peter didn't. He thought that, that by him saying he's the Messiah, that Jesus was going to be the soldier king that's going to come and release, release um, Israel from the Roman oppression and give them a geographical kingdom that would, that would allow them to rise into this new revolutionary. Like, that's what they were expecting. They were expecting the, the, the oppression of Rome to be, to be released through this Messiah coming. But Jesus says, actually, I am the Messiah. You're right. But I'm the Messiah that, that God's called me to be, not who you want me to be. And, uh, and it's, a, it's an amazing thing that actually, God, you are the Messiah. Would you show me what that means? Would you touch my eyes so that I can see? I think that's my preach. Can we stand? Maybe the band can come up. Uh, we're having some baptisms this morning, aren't we? Maybe you can open up the, the baptismal font. And if you're going to be baptized this morning, maybe you can just go get ready um, just as we celebrate that together. And, uh, and I've, been, I've, been, I've been thinking and praying, and my prayer this morning is that we would see Jesus more clearly. That's my prayer, that we would worship him more freely. And, and that's for those who've been walking for ages and that's for those who perhaps are, are busy inquiring as to who Jesus is and, and, uh, and busy um, walking with him to see who he is. And, um, and my prayer is that God would show us. Can we, can we just take a moment? Can we close our eyes? And uh, sometimes these things need to happen. I, I was thinking about how, how Moses, when he asked God to, to show him his glory, it's amazing how God had to put his hand over him and cover him in a sense from his glory, cover him from himself. That hand had to protect Moses from the, the glory of who he is. But then we see Jesus saying, actually, I will put my hands on your eyes so that you can fully see who I am. Jesus doing something completely remarkable. He's actually opening up our eyes to see the fullness of God. Where, where, where Moses was told, the Lord, the Lord, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, maintaining, maintaining faithfulness to a thousand generations. Jesus, using his hands to open up our eyes and see the full embodiment of what that means. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? And, and my prayer this morning, Lord, as we, as we close off, I ask you, Lord, would you put your hand on our eyes? Would you put your hand on our eyes, Lord? The beautiful hand of Jesus coming and opening up our eyes as disciples so that we can see you more clearly for who you are. I ask you for those who have been walking for a long time, who perhaps are feeling uh, a little bit blind or, or feeling like they're not seeing things clearly. Lord, I pray that by your Spirit, would you, would you open up, would you touch our eyes so that we can see you more clearly for who you are yet again. I pray that for those who are new and are, are, are searching you out, Jesus, and happen to find themselves in the crowd today. I pray that you would open their eyes, Lord, and that, and that as they answer that question, who do you say that I am? Lord, that they would see you clearly. As the great, as the great Messiah, as the one who offered up his life, 
as the one who was, was broken on the cross, your body broken, your blood poured out, our shame put on you so that, so that we could find freedom and wholeness. God, I ask you that you would open up their eyes. I ask that they would be able to, 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 to convincingly and with, with, with their full heart, Lord, say that you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And I choose to follow you this morning. God, would you minister to your church, I pray. Would you, would you, would you free us from, from seeing circumstance? Would you open up our eyes that we could see? I ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.